Bonjour, everyone. Welcome to Learning to Scale OpenStack. It's the Juno update from the Rackspace Public Cloud, specifically around the build, release, and deploy systems. This is not my favorite microphone, but this is one of my favorite quotes. In preparing for battle, I have always found that plans are useless, but planning is indispensable. Dwight D. Eisenhower, 34th President of the United States. I have a lot of letters that I can put after my name that certify. I can plan projects and implement really good software development processes, but I've been a developer long enough to know that all the process and planning in the world doesn't actually get you where you need to go. You just need to code the stuff. So, um, but I have learned that the actual art of planning, of talking, of coming together, of collaborating, going through that conflict is really helpful. And that's really what we do every six months when we come together at OpenStack is we, we, we go through the planning, which is indispensable. This is what OpenStack is trying to do. Rainbows and unicorns all around the world. Space unicorn, Google it, hilarious, earworm for the day. Um, there's a lot of optimism. The keynotes after four years have been, you know, th those are some of the best, best yet as you're seeing the way that this software is changing how companies perform, how their data centers work. Um, the reality of where we are right now is more like that. Um, this is the Miltonius blog unicorn of technical difficulties. I don't know where it comes from, but I saw it one day and just like, yes, that's what we are. The, the unicorn is tangled up in the, in the inner workings. And so today I want to just walk you through what Rackspace has done for the last six months in the Juno cycle and give you a kind of a glimpse of where we're going as we look to Kilo. My name is Rainia Mosier and I am a software development manager at Rackspace for the build, release, and deploy system that does all of the OpenStack public cloud control plane deployments. So we are still, I believe, the largest public OpenStack deployment. So when we're talking about scale, it's this massive horizontal scale that the private cloud use cases aren't having to deal with just yet, but I personally believe they will sooner rather than later because big clouds or little clouds grow up to be big clouds. So let's define scale. Rackspace's public cloud is in five time zones in four countries. There are six production regions, and we have over six and growing lower level environments. So for our CI, continuous integration, test, pre-production, stable environments, those, those are all they need to be deployed to. Um, there's over 20,000 hypervisors and growing, over 20,000 computes and growing, and over 2,000 control plane nodes and growing. And we have to upgrade that code regularly in order to stay up to date with OpenStack, provide new functionality to customers, and most importantly, provide the stability features and functionality that are coming into, op into OpenStack as that product platform matures. So it's a lot. Yeah, I actually got to deploy, push the actual button to London. That was really, that was really cool. That was really cool. It's one thing to, to develop it and design it, and another thing to actually deploy to a couple thousand things in another country. So here is a super simple explanation of what the build, release, deploy system does in the public cloud. A user comes in, hits the API. That's where the control plane is. Nova, Glance, Neutron services live up in there. OpenStack magic happens. It comes down to the data plane, which at Rackspace is Zen Server and OVS for networking. Pops out a customer VM, and that user can now access that instance. For the build, release, and deploy system, it is just going to upgrade, disturb, touch the OpenStack services, and it's not going to come down into the data plane layer where that customer's instance is. So any impact that the customer feels is going to be on performing actions on their instance, not on actually being able to access their instance. So if they have a website that they're serving up to customers and we do a control plane upgrade, that website's going to continue to function. However, they won't be able to maybe rebuild it or hit the API as the, as the services upgrade. So what have we done so far in 2014? To date, we have upgraded the control plane at Rackspace 11 times. 
It is the lowest number in the two and a half years that I have been here. Um, it's definitely getting more and more difficult to upgrade an OpenStack um, deployment at any scale. And a lot of the talks and sessions, design summits, operator meetups that I've been through today have really iter reiterated that, that the deployment pain is now, is now real. And how do, we, how do we fix that? So um, let's go into some details around the ones that we've done. So our, we, we work in what we call iterations. We started the year on iteration eight, which is representative of an upstream pull from trunk, from OpenStack trunk. Pulled it down. We did three deploys from that. And the main thing we accomplished, aside from just keep, keeping up with OpenStack, providing stability features, was we were able to expose the public glance API, uh, which allows end users to go through public glance rather than having to go through Nova for all of that. Um, that took us through the end of March. Iteration nine overlaps. That's, that's one of our goals is to try to keep it going continually. Um, we were only able to do two deploys because it was the migration to Neutron. <laughs> and it was particularly challenging. There was some really great sessions last summit in Atlanta if you want to go back and listen to the, the videos and, and find them. Um, it, that, that migration to Neutron was much more painful than we thought it would be. Um, we learned a lot. The community learned a lot. Now Neutron is deployed, and that is what we use. Um, we're, we just wrapped up iteration 10. Um, one of the, the downsides of having waited so long in that iteration 9 with the Neutron deployment is that there was a bunch of code that got stacked up upstream that we couldn't pull down. And so then we had to take that gap and catch up, restabilize, make sure everything that was happening on upstream still worked with our internal billing system, for example. Um, so we had, a, we had a gap there where we needed to reset, refocus. Um, we did six deploys from this because there was a, a big push at Rackspace at the end, uh, you know, towards the end of the year to launch some features. Boot from volume has been supported in OpenStack for a while, not supported by all of the public clouds. We really wanted to kind of put that out there. Let's get this, let's get this working and usable in a production cloud. Um, new flavors were launched, and just a, a bunch of new orchestration. We changed out the deployment orchestration, which we'll talk a little bit about here. Um, so we did a lot in that iteration 10, so it, it was beneficial to us to extend it a little bit longer. Um, now we're starting up our iteration 11. We have three deploys planned through the end of the year and into early January. And the main focus here is to actually expose that public Neutron API point so that you can interact with your networks outside of Nova, which will be very cool. How do we do all of this? <laughs> it's a real simple system. Um, we have a combination of open source software, internal Python that has been written and put together to orchestrate, interact with things. Um, a little bit of proprietary licensed software comes into play, and it all works together somehow. Magic and really hard work to go um, to actually function. So we're going to go through each of these, starting with OpenStack code. We start everything from upstream. And specifically, when we're talking about the control plane and what, what my team is really focused on, we're, we're really focused on Nova Glance and Neutron, so the compute and network portion. Um, and we, we depend on upstream OpenStack and the CI gate and the OpenStack infrastructure team and all of the amazing work that they do to even start our process. Um, so for all the work and all of the detail that we're going through here, there's a ton more of work that happens before it even gets to this point from the upstream OpenStack code. Even though OpenStack is great and the CI gate is amazing, um, there is the need, whether you are doing just configurations, integrating with legacy systems, um, need to make sure that it works with your billing internally, uh, there's a high probability that you're going to need a change that is not in upstream OpenStack master trunk. And that's where the patch management comes into play. This is um, Ply is what we use. 
It was written by Rick Harris, who is a Rackspace employee and a contributor to OpenStack. Um, and it's just it's GitHub-based ply management. This allows us to put changes on top of OpenStack without rewriting history <laughs> or risking a, a overwriting of changes from a Git force, from a force push, which has happened, and that's why we invented this. Um, so, so that's how we do the patch management. Our configuration management, we are transitioning from Puppet to Ansible on a project-by-project -project basis. Um, we have been previously on, we've had a, a centralized Puppet, Puppet Masterless is what we're using right now. And as we explored more with Ansible, pushed the limits of its scale, are seeing that for what we're doing at the scale that we're working at right now, it works really, really well. Um, a lot of projects like Heat that are doing orchestration more at an application layer right now, Triple O is, is coming as it comes through, and, and the fact of it is, is we have to be able to do this now, and so Ansible is working, working really well for that use case. Um, issue tracking. Launchpad, definitely. We depend on Launchpad and Garrett, the review system, which is the upstream issue tracking. However, we have internal project managers, internal program managers that need to know what's going on and track towards improvements and functionality within the business. Um, and so we're, right now we're using a mix of Redmine and Jira. Redmine is open source, Jira is licensed from, um, is licensed. And um, I think Jira is gonna win <laughs> in terms of standardizing. Um, so, but, but we're using a mix, mix of all of that then we have our change gate that integrates with both Redmine, Jira, and Launchpad right now to um, help with the GitHub pull requests, run unit tests, make sure there's an actual issue number in the commit message, update the issue tracker with link backs, update GitHub with link backs. Um, and this just allows us to have some measure of sanity as changes are coming in internally. It is nowhere near the scale or the um, coverage that the upstream gate provides, but it does give us a little, it gives us some measure of this isn't going to break everything um, before it gets packaged. And we are looking internally at standing up our own Garrett, which is how upstream OpenStack manages things. But haven't gotten there yet. So we do have an internal enterprise GitHub that we use, it's a, it's a, secure, pla a secure place for our sensitive settings, passwords, SSH keys, um, proprietary configurations that are unique to us. Um, and it's also a sandbox so that we can move our product development forward strategically when we need to deviate from the upstream what we can get into trunk. We're almost there, packaging. It's actually a great talk later today around packaging from two of my coworkers if you'd like to go into more detail about how we do packaging from upstream. Um, at a high level, the package artifact is a tarball of project code that's been put into a virtual environment, bundled up with the um, configuration file, either the Ansible, manif the Ansible playbook or the Puppet manifest, and then uploaded to a package service and distributed via torrent. Um, if you'd like to hear more about that and where we're going. I strongly encourage you to, to attend that session and the time, I'll have a slide with the time and the location for you. And the last thing, this is something I'm, we're really actually extremely proud of, is the deploy orchestration. It's Ansible playbooks triggered by Jenkins with some Python goodness underneath it to drive this all forward. Um, we upgrade the control plane first. We'll do any database migrations if we need to change the database from an upstream um, patch set, and then we upgrade the computes, and then we're done. Um, when I first started, when I first took over this team and really started exploring this space, deploys would take six hours. They were awful. Um, now we can actually do a deploy of our largest data centers in the U.S. with over 6,000 computes in 30 minutes or less. That doesn't include all of the process that goes around that and the communication and the validation and the tests running, but the actual customer impacting period, we've gotten it down to less than 30 minutes. And if there's no database changes, we've done it in less than 10. Um, and it's just really, we're really, really proud <laughs> of that accomplishment when we know we started at six hours. <laughs> so um, it's a good time. So that 
is my system. That is what we have created over the last year, and it's really crystallized and matured in this Juno cycle to the point where previously my team was actually doing all of the deployments, actually pressing the buttons and managing all of them and staying up and going through all of that operational things. I've actually been able to turn it over to the individual product team. So now Compute runs their deployments and the network team runs their deployments. And we can go on to the next, the next level, which for me was the ultimate measure of success, was to be able to automate myself out of a job <laughs> so I could go do something else, <laughs> so I could go work on the next cool thing. Um, I've mentioned iterations a couple of times, and I just want to give you some insight into how we're handling the crazy code of upstream plus internal plus configurations. So like I said, everything starts upstream with OpenStack trunk. We have a Rackspace master that we keep where we have our patches and our configurations. We pull that down daily into Rackspace development using that ply process in the patch management system. Every day, we're going to branch and tag inside of Git, inside of GitHub, um, the code for that day, and create a package, and deploy it to a continuous integration environment and run some validation on it. So that's going to happen every day. It's not always successful. Actually, quite honestly, it's usually not successful. <laughs> Um, just because of the nature of some of the technical debt that we're carrying internally, it causes a lot of conflicts and you have to stop and resolve and move on. Um, but on the days when it just goes all the way through, the tests are green, that's, we, we actually do celebrate. <laughs> we do celebrate. Um, and then periodically, and there's not a set cadence, it's really based on business need at this point, there will be a periodic release branch selection for an iteration from one of those daily, daily branches and tags that, that went through and got a good, a good green run. Um, and it's really up to the, the dev managers and the product managers of each of the products to determine when that's the right time to do it. Um, because deploys are impactful to the customer, you do have to be a little bit um, selective on when you actually go. All right, so we've talked about the tech side. What are the, what's the software that we're using? How are we putting it together? Not getting too deep into the weeds, but just giving you an overview of what we've accomplished and how we're doing this. This is the process that we're following, and I can argue that it is more important in a lot of ways than the technology. As great as it is to get down to 10 minutes to deploy a large data center, Knowing what we have to do to get there is really, really important. Um, so the first half of this, and I'm going to go through it so you'll have larger and you can actually read it. Uh, the first half is our iteration CI, CD. This is the daily, the daily stuff that we can do um, for the continuous integration and delivery. Um, then the second half is going into a more traditional change and release management process where you stop, you schedule, you communicate, you check, and then you go. Um, and all together, this is an iteration cycle, and we may do this multiple times off of one major release branch um, so that we can not have to go through quite so much um, ramp up time. So let's go through the first part, which is the CI CD start. So, as I said, we start with OpenStack continuous integration all the time. Always, always, always. That's where we want to start. Um, then we're going to merge in local patches and go through the packaging, which includes the configs. And then we're going to start into the continuous integration, continuous delivery by deploying it to our CI environment. It's a very small environment, um, less, like, less than 20 hypervisors with, um, a single, with a control plane and a single cell. This is really just telling us, with automated testing, does OpenStack work with what we have to put on top of it? to make it work internally for the business. Um, once we have a good, a good go there, we promote it to actually selecting a release branch, and we're deploying it to a test environment, which is a little bit bigger, has more comprehensive test coverage, and is actually starting to do some integration testing. It'll integrate with the storage, so with Cinder, um, and so with Cinder for the volumes, it's going to hit more of on our identity side. Um, so we'll, we'll have a more in-depth 
um, validation there. And from there, once we're good there, that's where a dev, dev manager, product manager, the change and release manager can say, okay, it's time to actually cut a release branch and start working on a candidate, an actual release candidate. And that's this step here. Um, the release candidate process takes place in pre-prod, which is a shared environment right now. And so we do actually communicate out to the internal, internal consumers, quote unquote, of this environment to let them know, hey, it's gonna be unstable because we're putting new code in there. Um, so we're gonna take that package exactly from that previous test environment and deploy it to pre-prod, run tests and see what doesn't work. Um, this is gonna have even more integration. This will be a full integration with the entire business, all the notifications, all the way to billing, and we'll, and we'll be able to see um, how, it's, how it's functioning. If we find a issue, most often it's a config setting wasn't quite right, didn't get caught or just isn't tweaked correctly. You can do a pull request straight to the release branch, go, go back through the packaging process, and then redeploy. And you can repeat those steps over and over until you get that really solid release candidate that everybody's comfortable with. Um, this can take a week to three weeks, depending on what's going on and how bad it is. Um, if there is a, a bug that made it through, made it all the way down here. Um, and most importantly, it's not for feature development. This is just for stabilization. This is just for tweaking things, getting that last thing out so that you can actually deploy it to production. And that's the last step. Schedule the maintenance, take that package that you validated in pre-prod, deploy it to production, do some automated testing to make sure everything went okay, and you're done. Um, and so that's, that's the train that we're following, release pipeline, release train, uh, and it has worked fairly well overall. Um, takes a lot of people, but um, in terms of dev managers, change and release managers, and is not the optimal. We really do want to be with continuous all the way through and to automate this all the way through, um, but right now, OpenStack is not quite ready to support non-disruptive deployments, which is a requirement for that. So what are the limitations of our release train? We're not at a production scale in our lower level environments. The largest environment is pre-prod with around 200 hypervisors. None of the other, none of the production regions are that small anymore. Um, the shared train right now is being shared between compute and network and it leads to blocking issues where network can block compute or vice versa and they can't ship their products, ship their features. Um, multiple trains, however, will lead to coordination overhead between both automated systems and human beings, individuals, just being able to communicate what's going out when. Um, am I gonna overwrite you or are you gonna clash with me? And because we have to really stop everything and schedule a production deploy, the flow through here is not is just not continuous at all. Um, production deploys are disruptive. They have to be done after 10 o'clock local data center time. So in the U.S., that's for those of us that are in the U.S., that's staying up from 10 until 2 most often, or 10 until between 10 and 2. And then our international data centers, those are during our daylight hours. So they can be 10 p.m. And that's one of the the major things that stops our flow. Um, there is a lot, there has been so much great work done around that, around how to make these deployments less impactful. And one of my other colleagues will be giving a talk on Nova Conductor and the road to less impactful deployments later today as well, which I have a slide on here um, in a moment. So what are we doing about this? What can OpenStack do about this? What is Rackspace pushing to do? This is um, a quote by Martin Fowler talking about the microservice architecture. Some of you may recognize it as SOA. <laughs> um, and so that's another, another way of saying there's still lots of room to mess this up too. Um, but it's really about independently deployable services and OpenStack within the projects already have independent services. Um, each API registry worker is an independent separate entity that have common characteristics around their capabilities, automated deployment, intelligence in the endpoints, and decentralized control of languages and data. It's really the microservices architecture. It's a buzzword. I like it better than SOA. 
um, just because it sounds new and cool. Uh, but, but really, it's, it's giving us the opportunity to empower the dev teams to do that. If you build it, you get to run it, um, to avoid the monolithic nature that we have right now um, with our OpenStack deployments, and really empower individuals to, to be successful all the way through. So what we're doing right now is Neutron is ready and able to deploy independently or actually they will be in iteration 11. That's the main thing as well with that Neutron API. Um, and then up next is Glance and StackTac, because we use StackTac for our monitoring and um, notification things. Um, and then we're going to end up taking Nova out into its own packaging. As we go, um, we're just converting from Puppet Manifests to the Ansible playbooks for the configuration management and enabling each team within Rackspace to fully own their packaging, their, their software development, their operational, their packaging, their deployment, their testing. Um, it's a great, great thing. It's a great thing. Makes everybody have that ownership. Um, and we'll see how this comes about in the next couple of cycles as OpenStack itself realizes their growth challenges and that within each of the, you know, the, each of the major projects, there's only so many reviewers, so many leaders. How do you split up the work? And they talk more and more about dividing on, on sub-project on sub project lines, so at the service level. I mentioned there was a couple of talks today that were relevant. Um, up at 11.50 in this room is the road to minimally impacting live updates of the Rackspace public cloud. This is really going to go into some detail around how Nova Conductor works. Um, as far as we can tell, no one has used it yet at scale. So this will be, this is an experiment for us on how it will operate and function. No one knows how many Nova Conductors you need. So we're going to find out and let everybody know. Um, and then the second, the second talk today is at 3.30, 15.30. Um, building the rack stack, and so it's packaging from upstream OpenStack. And on that one, they'll go into a lot more detail about how, how the virtual environments are created, how the packages are distributed, um, and where we're going in the future. And that's an amphitheater blue, which I saw on the sign, so you should be able to find it if you'd like to go to that one. The, the thought I'd like to leave you all with is from the principles behind the Agile Manifesto. Today I've heard, or this week I've heard a lot of talk about how Scrum doesn't work, we, that OpenStack isn't agile. And Scrum and agile are not synonymous. Um, Scrum is a flavor of an agile framework. And so our highest priority is to satisfy the customer through early and continuous delivery of valuable software. And I think for all the developers I know, all the operators I know, they want that to be the case. And so, so for that, I, I look to the future as we continue to pursue the continuous delivery and deployment as we continue to pursue making this work, making this easy at large scales, at small scales for all use cases. And I look forward to what we are able to accomplish in Kilo and hope to be back to give you an update then. So thank you very much and I'm happy to take questions. Hello. Uh, Hello. Uh, can you could, could you please tell uh, a little bit about testing tools that you are using for all uh, all of the things? Uh, tests? Um, so on the upstream on the upstream pieces, we're using. So I'll just go into the back to this one. So mm -hmm. upstream and continuous integration, we're doing Tempest. We rely on Tempest. Um, once we get downstream of of, um, of the code on the testing here, we're using a tool called Cloud Cafe mm -hmm. um, to validate that the instance goes all the way through, not from API calls all the way through to pingable. So it, it, it tests on, on the data plane also? Yes, it tests that the instance is functional mm -hmm. at the end, and that is, that is the requirement for all of these gates is that you have to be able to boot usable instances. And usable includes network and... Thank you. Cloud Cafe, so C-L-O-U-D, 
C A F E. And it is, I believe it is open sourced on the Rackspace public GitHub. And he's shaking his head yes, so he's agreeing with me. So yes, plus one. <laughs> It, it was it, it was developed internally by um, um, by the by the Rackspace Quality Engineering Organization. So yes. Say that again. The question was: We're not using Rally for the performance data. I am not as familiar with how we do the performance testing, so I am not certain what we are using for the performance testing data. We may be. I would imagine it's still Cloud Cafe, though, because that is pretty pretty well established in the QE organization. Looking to see if there's anybody here that would know, but no. <laughs> yes, sir. Um, on your early slide, you mentioned in your cloud, um, you have about uh, 2,000 compute nodes. So I'm just wondering, um, on average, how many VMs uh, one compute node you host in your, in your cloud? It's going to depend on this, on the, the flavor of it. There's multi, there's different types of hardware, in in each cloud in each data center, and the type of hardware is going to determine the number of VMs, and it's also going to depend on the size of the VM. There are certain hypervisors in the standard, kind of in the standard flavor line, that can only hold one thirty gigabyte you know, 30 gigabyte instance, there are, and that same instance would be able to hold you know, maybe five, eight gigabyte instances, for example. So it's really, it's, an, it's a math equation of how many 512 slots do you have, and then what size flavor are you doing? Okay, so maybe, uh, yeah, I know it depends on the software, I mean, right. on the hardware of the servers and the configuration of the servers, but the, uh, on a, a bulk numbers, uh, so like, uh, what the range we're talking about, right? Like uh, on the low end, on the, uh, on the high end, uh, so what are the numbers? I am not able to just call up the data plane numbers uh -huh. from no, my head. No, um, I mean the, v the, the VMs. Yeah, I, I'm, not, I'm honestly not certain about those numbers. I, I think it's just gonna vary, it, it's, it's too big of a range and I don't, I don't have that number in my head. I can help you find that out though. Okay, okay, so. Uh, Sorry. No, yeah, that's fine. Uh, my next question is, uh, so with all those 2,000 computers, right, so how many, like, uh, the open set controllers, right, you, you, you use to, to manage, are using the hierarchical models, or? Um, we use cells to manage the computes, so. No, uh, how many control nodes? You control like? nodes, the, the control nodes, there are 2,000 control nodes and 20,000 computes. 2,000, okay, yeah. thanks, thanks. Yes, sir. Hi. Um, firstly, thank you for your talk. I think what you presented was dynamite today. Thank uh, you. Could you tell us how big is your team to achieve this? Right now there's four. Um, I can tell you it's not big enough. <laughs> um, at one point, I, my team has gone through a crazy, I could probably give a 40-minute talk just on that, a crazy evolution. Um, we started as a team of three full-time employees with a team of four thought workers who's a really valued consulting partner, um, spread out all over the country and all over the world. We had India, South Africa, and all of the time zones in the United States. And it was a nightmare, and I don't know how we accomplished this, but we did. Um, and so, at its largest, it was seven. Now we're down to four as people have moved on to other projects as we've accomplished what we set out to accomplish. Um, but yeah, it's, a, it's, it's about five is where I would say we're at. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you for your talk. C could you come back a few slides where you have the iterations and the deploys? That yeah, one. That one, yeah. What makes, in, within an, in, an iteration, what, det what determines the number of deploy that you actually, do you know uh, at, at the beginning, the number of deploy you're going to do, or it's more like you have to adjust uh, depending on... If progress. I had my way, we would know, and we wouldn't do any minor iterations, and we would do one deploy for each major branch from upstream, and that would be it, and then we'd start over. However, there are business needs, so the number of deploys from a major branch is going to be determined by business product needs. So, so it's if we need to launch a feature or five features, 
that sort of thing. So the, the features are within a deploy, mm -hmm. and then iterations are more a way to group uh, Correct. deploys into a consistent uh, a release cycle? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. If, if we could really, if the ideal is to be able to pull from upstream, the, the stated goal is to be able to pull from upstream every two weeks, deploy all the way through, and then start over. That's the stated goal. It's, it's still not there yet. Um, so, so yes, yes, sir. Um, are there any performance metrics that you use as acceptance criteria, or is it all functional verification? Right now, it's primarily functional. Um, when there is a major change, and, and we're talking like changing the way mm -hmm. networking worked when we switched to mm -hmm. Neutron, for example, from Quantum and Melange, there was extensive performance testing done by the Quality Engineering Organization for the just the kind of the normal ev run of the mill every day. Let's pull down 10,000 lines of new code and see if it works. W we're focused more on on just the functional testing. Okay. Oh, yes. Hi. Um, you said you reduced the deployment time from six hours to 30 minutes. Can you maybe explain more how you did that? A lot of sleepless nights. Um, so when we, first, when we first started, part of what we did was in the very first iteration, the distribution of the package artifact was part of the deployment. And so as the environments grew, that distribution took longer and longer. Um, so the first thing we did was to, to pull the distribution out and be able to do that on its own so that we can do that out of band you know, over the course of several hours if we need to in advance of the actual deployment window. Um, then we, we um, made use of Ansible to have the series of plays to actually go in and, and do, and the way Ansible works is you can have a certain number of forks, we run 500 at a time, to go do SSH tasks in parallel. And we have worked very closely with the Ansible community to help them get it working up at scale so that we can SSH through 6,000 nodes in a minute on a task. So even if you're having to do 10 tasks in sequence, you can actually accomplish that on 6,000 nodes pretty quickly. So pulling out the pre-staging and, and making, a, making the package a pre-stage action rather than part of the deployment was the number one thing. And then it was looking at how do we orchestrate and optimize the sequence of, um, of events and using a responsive so piece of software that, work, that worked well at scale, at our scale. Did that answer it a little bit? A little bit. <laughs> Any other questions? All right, thank you all for your attention. Y'all have a great rest of the day.